try and be lively and precise now. <laughs> <laughs> this is more where we feel we're sort of coming from. Um, we started off by sort of doing our interpretation of traditional dancers and nicked some from John Kirkpatrick and so on. And Roy Dommett has always come along and done one of these usual sort of generally what Roy used to do for us around about this time of the year. Uh, was to come along and have one of these fling several figures at you, fling a few dancers at you and see what you make of them kind of things and then we'd, we'd turn them into various dancers. <coughs> so we still keep up a repertoire of the traditional dancers, but like most sides we've been making up our own, which have been influenced by various different sorts of things. Sometimes it's something that a dance we've learnt at a workshop from another tradition, sometimes it's something that's just happened. We took one dance that we saw some um, Appalachian poggers doing and sort of turned that into borderish. Um, the two that we, I thought we'd do this afternoon are um, quite different. The first one is called Five Mushrooms, which got its inspiration after a workshop led by the Seven Champions. <laughs>
behind you and you, your hand may slip back towards the wrist. And rather than a circle round, sort of pull past one another. So do that and back again. And yeah. Then what you do is you do a solo turn on the spot. So you go to the left and you just arm and right. So in effect, the two double steps is sort of the arming and the four singles is to do the little turn on the edge. Well, you just try walking that. Ready, and one, two, three, pop. Two, two, three, pop.
count each time to start their little twirly bit. So everybody, left foot. But, so you should, everybody should be facing up, facing the music to start with, and then you turn as necessary, ready to start the first figure. Okay? So can we have a full <coughs>
between numbers one and three. Okay? Do you want to do that first bit with the chorus together? Let's do those together and see if that helps. Okay? So, positions for starting, everybody facing up. Five as in on the domino stops.
numbers one and three are going to do a figure around the stationary two and four. Mushroom, just stay still for a minute. At the end of this figure, you will not be back in your original starting position, but please remember your original starting number, because I will refer to you by that number. Okay. And the lower number, this will become clear in a minute, because you're going to do something where you have to wait for one another. The lower number takes precedence. So if you're in number one position, it's easy, because you always go first. Because <laughs> you're always lower than anybody else, if you're involved. So two and four, you'll be stepping, but if you just stand still for a minute. One and three, go around the outside, so go straight ahead, round the back of two and four. Number one takes precedence over three, so number one comes in between two and four and goes to the diagonally opposite, so it goes to what was the original number three position. And number three comes to this one. Meanwhile, while that's going on, the mushroom would be coming forward at the same time, just mushroom walk around, if that's okay, comes through the middle, goes behind number two, remembering that number one will be there, so they have to do quite a big loop, and comes back to the middle of here, the next side, so with a back to the music, as it were. Right? Let's try putting that together. So one and three back to your original positions. <laughs>
you go into that chorus, whoever is the mushroom does a quick rush and gets into that position. <laughs>
who are who got their sort of feet doing the same thing at the same time, you know. We, we did wonder about whether we can do this as a pantomime account. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that. For the arming to be tricky. So it's arming across, right arm, left turn. And because you've got a bit more room, you probably find you can actually sort of turn a little circle rather than turning on the spot. Then arming on the side, while the mushroom does the sort of egg time and things on the outside. Chorus. Haze, with the mushroom coming up the middle towards the music and going behind two to start it off, and then between haying with two and four, and then with four and three, and then with uh, three and one. Then the archers, and then the final thing. Okay? Mushroom, please. <laughs>
the beat, you start with the back end. And you start with the back end on this one. So, what, you, what you're going to do is stick with the person diagonally to your right, not your immediate opposite. So, two with them. One, two.
um, is a small room like this with lots of people. You'll have people's eyes out. So the U bend A starts by the people at the end of the set facing up. Everybody else face down. Okay. It's called a U bend because when you sort of think of the set as one can, or a horseshoe shape, if you like, but we say a U bend A. I don't know where it comes from. Um, and basically, you're going to do each arm, you're going to hay down, weaving right and left shoulders to the end, cross with your partner away from your music at the bottom of the set, and you always cross your partner with the right shoulder, come up the other leg, as it were, turn round and go, and so you're back to your original position. If you get lost, here are the two things to remember. At the bottom of the set, you, when you meet your partner, you cross them with the right shoulder to get across the set. At the top of the set, you turn left, both sides turn left. So let's just walk it, okay? So off we go, right and left shoulders. When you get to the bottom, part, cross over, cross with your partner, and up the other side. Keep going. Keep going.
last figure is very easy work. So it's just a standard back to back, passing right shoulders first, small, two steps forward, two to the side, two back and two one spot and then two steps forward, two to the side, two steps back and two on the spot. Dead easy. And then a skipping. You don't need to do that back to back, do you? No. No.
because the ends will have done something and there will be two lines that way. Yeah? And then the two lines will cross over. Just middle to the moment. Would you cross over? Okay. Then the middles are going to do the same thing again. The great thing is if you're a middle, once you started out, once you worked out which way you're going the first time, you just keep turning the same way again. So you're going to turn diagonally out, diagonally out. Turn to face your opposite middle. So number three and number five, I think you were originally. When you turn to face each other, you two turn, two blokes turn to face each other. Meet, two steps in. Turn. And you would then become the middle of a new line because the ends are going to be doing something, you know, I promise you. <laughs> Cross over. Yeah. Turn diagonally again, you middles. Turn to meet. In. Cross over. And then the final one, turn diagonally out. Yeah, well, you won't be quite at the end then because these will have done something. Turn to meet. So, okay. Sorry, two blokes. Right. Sorry, move back to the end there. Meet, cross, and you should be back where you started. Miraculous, yeah. yeah? <laughs>
and the lines will be forming across the set. Cross.
music by the right shoulder. At the top, near the music, you move to the left. Okay, so that's the U bend A, skipping, back to back, very straightforward. Skipping, jumps, the even side are going to jump out, the odd side are going to go like the clappers round and da 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 and face out while the evens come back around them. Sticking, and then cobwebs, which is the chaos we've just done. Sticking, music stops, yell one, two, three, four, and dance off, yeah? You can do it. <laughs>
McLean this morning, uh, Jeff and Mike from Flag and Bow for leading us this morning, uh, Paul into Windsor uh, uh, after lunch, and then particularly uh, just now with us, two dancers and Brogue. Uh, I have a memory of being here with Roy teaching some of the dances done by the Bedlands, and there was an incredible relief when he got to the, the end and realised he'd done it and succeeded to get to this incredible <laughs> complexity. So just like a quick round of applause for all those people and then Till is the address you put on the front. Right. Yes. So. Always uh, one. Okay. Well, I'll start them. Um, Dixton. First of all, the question is about you might you might wonder where is Dixton, and it's a few miles north of Cheltenham. And some a long time ago, a couple hundred years ago ish. Um, 20 years ago or so, someone <coughs> stood somewhere on top of this hill, which is Dixton Hill, which is quite a big landmark in Dixton, which is a place of one, one big house and a couple of farmhouses and a, and a few cottages, and painted a couple of paintings. And these were they. Um, the one on the top has the forest <coughs> interest in it, and the one on the bottom has the interesting landscape and the house. Um, and a quick acknowledgement, the first photograph was taken by Mark Rogers. Um, I'd, 
she's older than you look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I've always enjoyed going to see this painting, and always get a great thrill out of seeing it, and come away feeling very excited and elevated by it. Now, whether this is because the only time I've normally seen it has been when dancing at the Chippenham Folk Festival. Sorry, Chip Chelten Cheltenham Folk Cheltenham Festival. Cheltenham. Cheltenham, Cheltenham Folk Festival. And it's possibly in the afternoon after some good dancing and going to the pub. Whether that's a part of it, I'm not sure. But I've always enjoyed it. I find there's lots of life and interest and, and excitement and, and humour and, and stuff of interest in it. Would you tell everybody what the size of it is? It's immense. It's it starts, starts about there and it carries on to about here. So you, you, you really are advised to go and see it in real life to, to get a full appreciation of it. Because it's, 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 the, the, the both paintings are immense. And full of all sorts of detail, uh, which of course you can't see there. You can struggle a bit with your postcards. Um, but if we go on, uh, what's interesting, well, amongst the things that are interesting about it, was how faithful the, the artist, the landscape artist, was to real life. This is um, a Mark Rogers production. He got some cunning software to stitch them together. I use tape um, for my down there. But some of the bits that you can see in the paint are still there. Like the, there's a road that's there. That's not exactly, it's in exactly the same position. The pylon is a modern addition. Um, it's not good. That field boundary there is, um, that you can see there to the day, is, is still there. And all the, the hills in the background are more or less as they were then. It was. Sorry? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, Mont Gonfier was uh, 100 years after this. It was painted between about 1720 and 1730. And the bit of paper that I should have brought with me that said who it's painted by isn't. But I can tell you that nobody knows. It was right. exactly well, right. an artist called Anonymous. Anonymous. Uh, and it was painted for some people who uh, lived, <laughs> lived in this, this big <laughs> house of uh, Dixon Manor, <laughs> whose name have also forgotten, it doesn't really matter because they're, uh, they're almost irrelevant to this extent, that it was probably they who paid for the paintings. And my guess is that uh, th this was a house that they had recently built, and it's, it's still there. It's lost a bit, because the West Wing has gone, and that's exactly there. It isn't, isn't, isn't there anymore. My supposition is that that was the old house and that they moved from there to this big, nice modern stone one and got rid of this nasty old half timbered stuff which is just so passe. Um, and yeah, maybe it's just, maybe it's just to commemorate moving house all that distance that they had the paintings that the, the paintings created. We don't, we, we don't really know. So, except that they must have been quite proud about the place yeah. and happy about their environment. Yeah, it's not, it's not the same place. It's two separate buildings. What is? Yeah. Yeah, if you've got two photos in the bottom. There's a gap in the room. Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah. The top. Yeah. No, in the, between the two, between the two gables, oh. the top. In the photo. No, in the photo. Yes, I see there. Yes, yeah. there is, isn't there? Um, it's because that's that's the doorway. Look, I was looking up. This was looking down. I'll say this was painted for the top of Dixton Hill. It's covered in trees now. Although Mark went about ten years ago, when Julie and I went there in July. It's very heavily wooded, and also it is private property on top. And so that view is quite looking down. down. That's obviously at ground level looking up. So it's, it's, it's a faithful tower. reproduction because it's just the downstairs. If you were getting up there, tower. you'd be able to see between there, I believe. If it wasn't for the houses in between. <laughs> yeah, the uh, person who lives in the house is Lord McAlpine. Well, it, it's not. It's, <laughs> yeah, not, 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 it's not anymore. It was a farmer. We, we, we spoke to someone who worked for this farmer, and it was sort of Jones. Something slightly higher class than that, but he wasn't Lord anymore. Well, unless he was just underrating his, um, his stature. So, um, there's lots in it, and I'll try and bounce off a few thoughts about these paintings uh, as I go along. So this is, this is the, the, the card you've got, just enlarged, cutting out the sky, which is a bit uh, interesting. But the main elements of it are that it's a hay haymaking scene. It's sometimes called the Dixon Harvesters, because it's quite easy to, to think of that as a, as a concept. Um, Actually, the, the making hay, which is slightly different from the main harvest, which was the, 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 the cereal harvest, but the, the hay harvest is also quite important, as um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about later on. Um, so you've got big scenes like this row of people cutting, cutting grass with scythes, windrows, which, which they left behind them, of the, of the hay drying, uh, people round about, here and there, all over the place, out there particularly, turn, turning the hay out to help it dry. Um, Carts carrying stuff across, and there are some Morris dancers, but we don't want to dwell on those, do we? Um, but <coughs> um, amongst the things that, that you see there are you know, the, the bit that caps out my eye. I'll just yeah, I'll also say that um, I'm an agricultural scientist by training, so there's a bit of agriculture content to this. Um, I'll make no apologies for that. 
But you've got this row of chaps who were there um, cutting, cutting the grass with scythes. Um, this was hard, heavy sort of work, but also actually required great skill. And I think that you wouldn't find today, uh, well, you actually do find today, because people driving tractors tend to have the radio on. But there's a musician there. And this um, is not very clear in this, this image for reasons of technical failings. Um, when I first looked at it, I thought it was a fiddle, and I thought, no, it's not a fiddle, it's bagpipes. And then decided, eventually, no, it's a pipe table, which, of course, was the main Boris instrument for many years, and um, it preceded those delights, delightful things like melodies and concertinas by, by many, many, many years. But if you look at it in detail, the shape is quite different. The, the drum, instead of being a fairly tall, relatively narrow drum that you tend, would tend to use today, it's more like a brown in its shape, which is interesting thought. So, anyway, they're making hay. Um, you might ask why. Anyone know why? 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 Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's obviously grass goes, grass goes very well in the summer and stops in the winter. If you've got animals to feed, you need to conserve forage in some way. And haymaking was the first way of developed doing this. You do it by, 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 by making it dry in the sun, and if it's dry enough, then you stop microbial degradation so you can preserve it for the winter. That's the principle of haymaking. Did they know about that? Right. Well, of course, the ones on the left can hear the music better. Yeah. <laughs> the ones on the left are actually using their size. The ones yeah. on the right appear to be sharpening there, so they've stopped. Well, it's an interesting thought. To what doing. I think yeah, they, 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 could, they, they could be sharpening, or else it could be. I mean, I originally thought, oh yeah, little bit line. They're being kept in time by the music because you actually want to go progress across the field in quite a, a regimented way. If, if they're all going in a, a ragged line, then it would be very difficult. To, to arrange it so that you actually got all the hay cut. It's very important you know, you don't, you don't miss out the bits in between. If you did it in a straight line, you'd also cut the legs off the guy in front. <laughs> well, this is also another part. And what I was going to say is, um, but this is a Morris audience, this didn't work, um, that if you leave your questions till the end, <laughs> I might have answered some of them. You said you ask questions. You said you ought to ask why they're making hay. Well, yeah, I might have been. But Jen, it's quite important, important to, to keep, keep the line straight to get all the hay cut. And also, it's all part of the, the, the business about sharing out the work evenly in this sort of environment. Because people, the, the people here have all got to do a reasonable sh share of work in order to get, 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 get the stuff in. Because you cut the legs off the guy in front of you to if he was next to you. Yeah. Um, and basically, basically keep the line. But I did want to, I mean, Brian's point out that they're actually sharpening the sides. I did want it for some sort of early Mexican wave. And that they're all <laughs> squishing along. Having on producing a noise a bit like a three-cylinder steam engine, sort of Presley Pacific, like that. Read like across the canvas. Um, but like, the important part about the, the, the hay harvest was that, like, like all the harvesting that went on by those people at that time, is that it's essential for the life of the community because they couldn't get a safe way to buy a bit more food. If, if any of the harvests failed, then they all suffered. And uh, as far as I, could, I would understand, that the, the hay harvest was important. Um, was such that the first animals that you would feed on hay would be horses, because horses were really the only sort of motive power you had apart from, apart from humans. After that, you feed them to, to dairy cows and, and other sorts of animals. Uh, but it meant that for a lot of this period, until we had effective, efficient forage conservation, lots of animals got slaughtered in the winter because there's nothing for them to, to live on. And if it was a bad year, if it was a wet year, uh, the hay would go mouldy, it would um, lose lots of nutritional value, it would release lots of aspergillus something other than spores, give people farmers lung and make them quite unhealthy. So actually making, making hay well was an important part of community activity because if it didn't happen, then everybody suffered. And even though, I mean, they knew that there was, with their work, they were supporting the, the ruling classes, and people who did rather less work, um, it affected them all because it, it, there, wasn't, there wasn't this abundance of food that you could just import from elsewhere. Wasn't this one supposed to be the common meadow? I think it may well have been the common meadow, which might explain why they enjoyed themselves so much. Uh, that, that, that's one theory about it, that that's a common bit of common land, and on the other side it will be enclosed. Um, now the scythes, I mean, I don't know how, you know, how accurate that, that scythe is, but this is a, a sort of cumbrian scythe, but if you look at the size of it, it's absolutely immense. This huge long blade, a fearsome thing, and uh, as Tim said, you've probably got this diagonal line to stop you actually cutting the ankles for someone else there. But in the painting, you see, it's all men who are actually doing the, the, the cutting work, but no women or, or boys. Um, and it was probably, well, I think it was and is a very skilled job. And it's part of the thoughts about the people who used to dance for us is that they had all sorts of manual skills that, that 
they've often been lost. Not entirely, but not, not that many experienced scythe, cutter, scythe cutters around these days, or scythe makers for that, for that matter. Um, interesting that he hasn't got handles on this one. I'm attempting a scythe of having handles built in. So I think he's got he's probably it. Maybe he's going to see them. It's what's all the shown. Show it could, yeah, all that all that they're making more skills than, than they used to be. But of course, also the part of this is that sometimes you can use it as a, as a weapon. In, in civil wars, insurrections against the ruling classes, and all the civil sorts of weapons used, used in Captain Smith. Ah, Captain Smith, right. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's the sort of thing that looked like. F formidable, ferocious, ferocious items. And I presume that the, uh, the ones actually doing the cutting would have been paid rather more than the ones doing the turning and, uh, and get, getting, getting stuff into stooks. So the, the uh, people's size would have come along, cut, cut along there, produce, produce this grass, for example, to dry it in the sun. People would come along with, uh, with forks, uh, wooden forks like we got there, and, and rakes, turn it over a few times, get it to dry, and then put it into stooks in the field. And then once it's in the field, um, you get a bit more drying, but once it's in little heaps like that, if it rained, uh, you get a degree of self-preservation because the water sensor come off the top, and so the surface in the centre doesn't get uh, damaged too badly. And then it's got to get moved off back to a, a big haystack um, elsewhere, which is these, these wonderful uh, trains of horses, horses with carts. But there's huge cockades on the head, which uh, maybe is artistic <coughs> license, but I think the bit of fun that's there, part of the painting, is um, there's these incredible decorations for the horses. The, the people that are working there might not have thought it's such a good thing. But um, that's rather the money was spent on them. But of course, I mean, the, the, life, the, the lives of these people was so, so different from ours, because they weren't actually slaves, but they were um, very closely bound up to where they lived. They were almost, almost owned by the people who uh, they, they worked. Um, but, but there were some opportunities for people to move around, um, uh, but you tended to, to work for a set period between, between the, the hiring fairs, typically uh, quarter days, when workers would be taken on or laid off, and, uh, and that was sort of a way out. Um, the, 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 the possible opportunity to, to get away from an unpleasant landlord or, or, or master. Um, and so, I mean, the hiring fairs kept going until around about the, the early part of the 20th century, uh, this one was in, in Burford about 1890, sorry, 1895. Um, one of the collection pictures on the English Heritage website by Henry Torn. Um, this actually um, is, I mean, it must be a relatively, you know, not quite the last hiring pair because they probably stopped about the First World War, actually. Um, so lots of, lots of our workers waiting around, waiting to be, waiting to be hired um, to, to find a new master or mistress for the next few months. Uh, interesting enough, personal relevance there, this is the this is the, the, the lamb in Burford, which is where Julius family used to used to run that pub. It's a, it's a hotel for some years. Um, hiring fairs also appear in literature. Uh, probably one of the most famous ones is in *Far from the Madding Crowd*, Thomas Hardy, where a chap whose uh, whose Very dogs were George and George's son, two final dogs who never did run, chased all the sheep over the cliff, the cliff, went off to try and get hired, and and it was a bit of a bit of trickery. People used to go along with with the emblems on to show what trade they were. Um, in the case of that chap, who I think was played by Alan Bates, who keeps knocking off Julie, Julie Christie in all sorts of films, doesn't he? But uh, anyway, I mean, he, he was sort of asked, asked um, <coughs> what, 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 you know, what his job was, and one farmer said, you know, he was like after a shepherd, and, 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 and Alan Bates always said he, was, he wanted to be a, uh, a bailiff, and then the next one wanted a bailiff, and he said he was going to be a shepherd, and it didn't, it didn't work very well. Anyway, hiring fair. So people, that, that was people's exit route. Uh, this is a bit more the agricultural stuff. Um, while, he, while, while he absorbing that, um, the, the main crop was mentioned apart uh, that, that, that hay was a secondary crop. It kept things going, but humans couldn't eat that. We could eat secondary products like meat and milk and, and, uh, and uh, cheese and stuff like that that came from the milk. But the main staple food of of people in England for years was 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 bread, which of course comes from wheat. Now, wheat is um, interesting stuff. It's now, it's been around for donkey's years as a, as a staple food, but if you just go and get some wheat from a plant and eat the whole seeds, then you don't get very much nutritional value. Marvellous bowel movements, but um, <laughs> not much nutritional value. Because what you have to do then is, is take that and um, process it in some way in order to get better nutritional value from it. And for years, grinding, grinding it into, into, into flour from which pasta and um, bread have been made, well, not, not pasta in this country until recently. Um, has been the main way of doing it. But it's very demanding in energy. Um, about 25 years ago, there was a, a film series on, on, on the box about uh, recreating life in the Stone Age, a Stone Age village, 
which had a group of about 10, 10 people to 12 people living in a, in a round, big roundhouse in Dorset. And it took two of them about a whole day every week. Um, so they spent the whole time just drying up corn by hand. So very demanding in energy. And there's actually one, one example where in most of agriculture <coughs> until around about this time when the Industrial Revolution started, there was a gradual move towards mechanisation in agriculture. But the, the most useful tool that, that humans ha had for food processing was, was um, the mill. Because, it, because you could use water or wind energy to grind up the corn and, and get far better nutritional value out of it. There was one alternative, however, which has another Thomas Hardy connection, um, and also a sort of, sort of vague Morris connection through mumming plays. Um, if you consider some of the texts of clown plays, such as on Spro uh, Sproxton in Lincolnshire, um, when young Tommy says, Stop, 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 you old flip flaps. I want to ask some of your riff raff to me and my old, to me and my old girl's wedding. What do you like best you better bring with you? I don't know what you like. Some like fish, some like flesh, some like fruit and frumity. But we, what me and my old girl like best, we're going to have. Well, the key word there is frumity. Anybody here ever met frumity? Or frumity? Frumity? Whatever it's called. Not a popular dish these days. Um, I've had it once or twice. And the, the, chap, the character who became the mayor of Casterbridge in his fall, when he had his bad time, used to go along to a hiring fair and eat frumity. Particularly the particular the frumity that, that um, someone produced, which was laced with gin or brandy. And there's quite a nice start today, a bit like pot. What, what, what it is as a, as a dish is you get whole grains of wheat, soak it in water, cook it very slowly, uh, tip it overnight, and then, well, then you can add whatever you like, whether it's fruit, cream, brandy, whiskey, gin. And uh, I think when I and, and some friends had it, we, we did lace it with something alcoholic, and it's quite nice. But it's just a different way of getting the nutritional value out of wheat instead of grinding it. And, um, I haven't actually requested it, but, it's, uh, but one thing about, about the, um, the change in, in agriculture, that, 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 that years and years, yields things were very low, we had low input, low output agricultural systems, um, gradually around about, around about this time you start finding big changes started to happen, but of course they didn't, they didn't get input there for a long time, around about 1700, Jethro Tull invented the seed drill, but it took a long time for that to get from where he lived. Uh, against a very sceptical and antagonistic work, workforce into the, into the, the, um, the agricultural world um, as a whole. Um, in Norfolk, Norfolk for, for horse rotation was, was invented by Turnip Town Town, which, which provided a very steady and s sustainable agriculture for the work for years. And actually, when it came to the yields, they didn't really change very much. I like, missed out the years from 1950. It was actually only about from 1950 onwards, or about the, the end of the Second World War, that yields really took off. And they suddenly became you know, this monumental level. Um, so this is in tonnes per hectare, it actually divide that by 2.2 to get it in tonnes per acre, which would be the more traditional unit, I have to think of these modern terms these days. But, but, but all these periods, most, most of the work done on the farms were done manually. You know, it was hard grinding work done by people, many of whom were Morris dancers, and, well some of whom were Morris dancers. I think about it was, was that, was that you know, we, we had this, this system of agriculture that didn't really have very much of the tools and, and power, except uh, things like plan. Um, and if you imagine actually trying to grow cereals without a horse plow, it would be a hell of a job, because you've got uh, these endless drills, huge areas to cover, um, to cultivate whatever. And for a long time, of course, uh, th these were the animals, th these were the beasts that plowed the fields and did most, most of the work, but the hardest work of actually turning the, turning the soil over they would have been cultivated in other ways before, before seeds at that time would have been um, spread by broadcast, just throwing it around from a, from a, a bag or a hundred years later using a fiddle to, to spread the seeds around. Um, I mean, the, one thing, again, about the, the old skills that lost is this incredible rapport between um, people working with horses and, um, and how they get them to do work. And, the, and they're all up against it because if it was wet, visible weather, the horses would get cold and they'd be slipping on the clay or whatever. The, or the plough boys would be, would, be, um, would be suffering as well. But these chaps were there doing all this work, uh, possibly being paid a bit more than some, some of the other agricultural workers, but they were there um, up against it day after day. And there's like a very long time friendly change. Uh, it was about 1830 that the first steam plough came around, but they didn't really take on in a big way until the latter part of the 19th century. Um, and these were formidable beasts with a team out 10, 10 or 12 people to run them. Uh, they could plough very large uh, areas of land in the day, and <coughs> huge ploughs which, which you didn't see the like of that for about 100 years afterwards because tractors couldn't actually pull that many, many furrows. Um, but eventually that, you know, there was a change from this dependence on human and horsepower through towards mechanisation. 
And eventually it was this chap, the Grey Ferguson, um, which eventually was the revolution. That's the base of today in agriculture. And it's not because it's grey, but because it's called the Fergie, um, or because it gives you post postural problems. But one of the other big changes is that yeah, you, you spend all your time on the traps behind you. Um, very bad for the body. On a metal it's, seat as well. Um, a hard metal seat, unsprung, does no, no end of harm to your back. And the modern ones are rather better. Uh, but it's got a three point linkage. Um, three points and you could att attach any implement to it. Until, uh, until Ferguson came along, it was a heck of a job to attach anything because you have a plough that's made in one place, uh, harrow somewhere else, and you probably spend half the day trying to bolt things together. Um, but that was the, the real technical advance which, which moved agriculture on. But there are some places where you can still find the old skills going on. When uh, I was first asked on a farm to reverse a four-wheel trailer with a tractor, it was sort of, it was like a spectator sport. They pissed themselves laughing at what I was trying to do with this tractor, which was failing miserably. It was going left and right, and the trailer kept going one direction, then the other. It was hopeless. Um, but what, one, of the, one of the good things about the skills of working with horses is that um, you can actually make four-wheel trailers work and get them to go wherever you want, and, um, and they're just right. This, this is actually Hungary. Um, this was a trailer with a horse. I forgot the horse's name, but the, the chap who owned the horse, this bloke, um, he loved the horse like... I think better than his family, really. Well, his first, what, first lot, what I like, love was probably wine, and then, and then the horse. But he could get it to go back to the forward anyway, and it was just right carrying that four barrels of wine around. Ideal sort of work. And as the, the day goes on, um, you could even find, you, you get um, jockeys to come along and have a go on the horse as well. So. Um, it was a lovely horse. It was pregnant, actually. You could, the, one of the good things about horses, you can still work them even though they're, even though they're pregnant. Anyway, uh, Laura's content. Back to this, sorry, this long digression from where we started. Back to Dixon. Um, there are lots of bits and pieces in this picture that um, I like a lot, but obviously probably the most important one for the of you and Morris is, is this, this collection here. Um, six dancers, interestingly, there aren't any musicians nearby. There are musicians out there working the field, helping people to go along, cutting and cutting and raking. Um, there isn't one in sight. Um, I do wonder about this character here. Yes. Is, it, is it the musician? Is it someone who's just gone behind the hedge for a pee who's trying to catch up with them? Just a, just a child trying to, trying to follow on? Um, nobody really knows. I mean, it's, what, it's, just, it's just, just a mystery. Um, and also, uh, another feature about it is if you consider what, what sort of kits people wear, you do get a fair number of teams around that wear breeches, white socks or coloured socks, white shirts and baldricks. And obviously, they have got a variety of coloured baldricks on. The baldricks apparently became rather more popular I think the Civil War. They, they were used for carrying guns, swords, and ammunition, that sort of stuff. Uh, here just used for decoration. And if you look at the figures in the rest of the painting, basically the, the men are wearing exactly the same clothes, except they didn't have the baldricks on. Um, and obviously these, you can just actually bell pants here and there. Not very, very clear, but obviously they've got bells on. And the, 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 the other workers haven't got those on. And they've got black hats, and they look a bit like the tricorn hats that Northampton Morris men wear. Um, you can almost, almost base there. Well, that was the Morris Men's on that kit today. But I think my favourite about the kit is that what people used, used, to, used to wear for Morris was very much the contemporary clothing of the day, but with some embellishments. Um, so in some ways, it, 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 it's possibly arguably anachronistic for contemporary Morris teams to, to wear clothes that, to, that date from two or three years ago, um, just because there aren't images of them, because I think what, what people have done is, is move on. Um, they weren't wearing medieval costumes, even though the dance format might have been very, very much older. Uh, one thing it has got is uh, these three characters at the front. Uh, these, as I understand them, are whifflers. Um, not, not many around today, but there are one or two. Um, uh, as I see it, their, their main role is sort of ceremoni ceremonial and guiding people along. Now, there are some, <coughs> uh, some modern whifflers have been around. In the year 2000, there was a reenactment of Will Kemp's Nine Days Wonder. Well, not sort of reenactment, um, a correct well, sort of. It was a, ver a veritable marathon. Um, the people actually danced from London to Norwich in nine days. He actually he had rests on the way, which was cheating. The, 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 the people who did the reenactment, they, they went for it. That's the master done in eight days. Anyway, it was, it was incredibly hard work. Uh, they, danced, they danced the whole way. And um, people involved with this who read about it, read Bill Kemp's book. And so when he arrived there, he was met by some whifflers. And these, these were um, the, the, the recreationists thought, right, well, we ought to have some whifflers to be to make these uh, contemporary models dancers, so they did. Uh, and that's one of them, one of them there. 
um, another one hiding at the back. And basically, that, that they're from Kemp's Mill. Sorry? Not likely from Kemp's Mill. Right. <laughs> Inside knowledge. Um, and this is in Norwich, the, leading, leading the procession through. Um, and basically, they're there to clear the way, make room. Um, in this case, they were carrying swords. I don't think they're very serious swords. I think they're actually made of wood rather than anything violent. Uh, the ones that Dixon painted have got nice tassels on the end, so they're, they're even, even less threatening. Um, but then they have another role, a sort of ceremony role, sort of support act. Uh, while the main business was going on, they sort of stand and look important, but they hold the papers that are, are read out. And there's a box there that was that carried greetings to the Lord Mayor of London across to the, 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 the Lord Mayor of Norwich. Um, so, so they're, they're with us. Um, quite nice to have. But what they were doing in that field, clearing away through no crowd at all, <laughs> is an interesting that was question. Very, very successful. That's all. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, no, absolutely. Yeah, but, I mean, we sometimes think, oh, two men and a dog will make a good audience for this lot. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's a question about what they're doing there. Why are they there? Because why aren't they because, working on the hay? Because, why, because well, they could have been working on the hay. They could also be. Um, it could be an artistic interpretation as as, as the fact that. Um, it was fairly well established that lots of, a lot of people used to go and follow the hay harvest and go, go hay making through from the west to, 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 to the east and head towards London. Um, and lots of Morris people who used to try used to and dance in London uh, to earn extra money. So whether they actually um, said, right, sorry chaps, we're off to go and earn some money yeah, dancing Morris on the way to London, we don't know. <laughs> they're heading east though. <laughs> sorry? Uh, no, they're heading west, sorry. That's true. They're coming back. Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was told about Londoners. Well, um, and, and, and then it's also interesting, you know, consider that they're Morris style. Um, there was a temptation, a, a temptation to say they're um, possibly, in fact, what they've been, been doing is, is they're off to the pub and they've just had um, quite a lot to drink. Maybe they're just coming back to the pub, maybe they've had lunchtime cider. Because like they're not entirely it. together. <laughs> so whether it's on their style or not is um, an interesting thing. Yeah, but it's, it's real bona fide Morris. We do look like it's wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, they've got names on the places, but it's, I don't know, oh, I still like it, it's, it's great. So, um, as I said, this was, this was, this was near Cheltenham, and this, this, this man here, uh, John, well, sorry, this man here, John Bing, um, he had a nephew who was also called John Bing, who did write some stuff about Morris. Now, totally different in, in, in uh, their social class, this one, um, he died in 1757. Sure. Well, in 1950s, sorry, 1756. He was he was meant to be no, fighting against the, against the French in the Norka. Um, he was a, he was an admiral, some captain. captain. Um, so he he lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he was. <laughs> I'm glad you had spot that one. He lost the battle, and uh, he was caught by the cowardice. And unfortunately, um, he was found guilty and he was shot. But the extraordinary irony about this is that um, he was actually the senior officer present, present at his execution, which meant that he had to give the order for his own execution. <laughs> so he actually knelt down and he said, you know, he gave the instruction when he dropped his handkerchief, he, he, the fire was called, but then shoot him, and that's what happened to him. Um, anyway, his nephew was another chap called John Bing, uh, who went, went around the country, high up in social status, became a Viscount later on when he inherited the title. But he observed all sorts of things, including Morris and folk activities on a few occasions. Uh, one of them I went with about was, uh, was actually a place where I work in a place called Silso, which was quite upbeat except for pointing out how desolate people's lives were. And you have to remember the huge, huge gulf between the people on that end of the social scale and the people in the Morris world. But he, was, he, was, um, he commented happily about Morris at times, but when he was uh, uh, around Cheltenham area, he saw some Morris that wasn't all that good. And some of us might have been in that position now and then of seeing Morris isn't all that good. Um, around about 1784, um, he came across the people in Cheltenham and he observed to them how their mummery appears tedious and as little enjoyed by the performers as the spectators. <laughs> <laughs> the, genius of the, nation, uh, uh, sorry, the genius of the nation does not take this turn. So he was quite critical about it and um, obviously he didn't want to have his time wasted. But um, you do wonder perhaps if. Maybe it was the descendants of these people who were the ones. You know, were they the team who would have walked before the Cheltenham? Um, we don't really actually know what, what the slot called. Were they called Dixton Morris? We don't know. Lost the ship. No. <laughs> um, ooh, right. Now, of course, the, the Morris history you know, it has gone up and down a lot. And uh, actually, I mean, around about the time of this painting, which was 1720, 1730, Morris was in reasonably good state of health. 
it was quite widespread in the countryside um, going along, but it had taken about um, sort of 50, 60 years before doing the Civil War. The Civil War, it was, it was put down along with almost any sort of enjoyment by Cromwell, um, but came back to life after the Restoration. And this uh, famous diary of Samuel Pepys, so obviously there's a family club because the chap there, Robert Lane, was my great uncle. He edited huge volumes, 24 volumes, on the lot, lot, lots of volumes of the Pepys diary. He knew uh, you know, everything all about this chap, Pepys. Uh, to my shame, I know very little except the odd bits that I've remembered. Anyway, uh, just an example of, of, of how people comment on the Morris. And it's very, it's, 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 it's a pity we haven't got these really nice d detailed descriptions of what they, how they danced, what they, what tunes they used, what the sets were like. It's all just a, a, a really a big mystery with just a few bits of hard, fa hard factor or information. Um, and May the first in 1663, uh, his diary entry was about a whole page. And what it says is, by and by, about seven o'clock homeward, in my way in Leadenhall Street, there was Morris dancing, which I've not seen a great while. That's it. That's what, that, that's what it says about Morris. <laughs> <laughs> volumes and volumes. <laughs> and obviously it was familiar to him. He didn't say he didn't like it or not, but it was, uh, it, 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 it didn't feel the need to describe it. Other, 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 de other areas of life he described in enormous detail. Um, but he saw a bit of Morris and said, there it is. So he, we, we knew it happened, but not much more than that. And obviously, the way he wrote about it, it, it had gone down and come back again, which uh, validates all the other sorts of observation. But uh, Pepys enjoyed music and quite a lot of other things, including drinking and philandering. Um, and it, it, interesting, about three days later, um, he mentions a, a, bit, a bit about how, how the dancing master came to visit his wife. And he actually implored a dancing master to come along to teach his wife dancing, and he, he looked a bit um, also. But he also was actually incredibly jealous and he used to go up onto the door and listen, and then leap in, <laughs> just to make sure that the dancing master wasn't getting too familiar with his wife. Which, given his um, philandering ways, was an interesting bit of hypocrisy. Um, but he was, he was taught to dance you know, in, in sort of couple dances, small, very small social gatherings, that's what he learned. But that's, he did use the country dancing, going on in dancing halls around the country, which also included dancing that were called Morris dances. And uh, they don't sound like Morris dancers because the, the the uh, uh, descriptions of <coughs> what went on make them seem more like dancers done in long way sets or country dances um, that, that, that that's more familiar to us. But there used to be a film going off to, off to balls like this. This one is in Bath. I mean, there were, there were public assembly rooms in Cheltenham or whatever. Um, and this, this painting was about 1750, 1760. So not, not very long after the, the painting of Dixon. But you know, people had a great time. A good flash at the Cayley. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a country dance. And it's interesting to speculate about how much interplay there was between the dance that went on here, where, where dancing masters used to teach, dan teach the popular dances, um, and but sometimes they were called Morris dances, whether any of that went out to the Morris, or whether they used to go and see what was going on in, in rural Morris and crowd bits and put it into these dances. I'm not absolutely sure, but there obviously was a, an interplay between them. And, right, yeah. Um, now, but, but of course, the people who people who were dancing in that hall would have been relatively well to do from the middle-ish classes probably, not the, work, not the working class, not the, the, the labouring poor as they were called for many years. And the, the gap between them is something that, that um, is quite difficult to, 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 to realise today because we've got a very fluid society um, in which the old social uh, strata have gone. And it's to me very well summed up by um, some words of George Orwell. Um, it's actually nothing to do with Morris, but it's about the difference in, in classes. Um, he, he, like Cecil Sharp, was the one down here, were both from the upper middle classes. Um, today, <coughs> it's, it's interesting how politicians talk about not upsetting the middle class. Nobody ever talked about the upper class anymore, or the upper middle classes. You, know, you assume that there's a middle class, there ought to be an upper one and a lower one. The upper one gets forgotten about, never gets blamed or um, made the responsibility of the middle classes. Which is quite but all well, like Cecil Sharp, came from the upper middle classes, they had to work for their living. They didn't inherit enough wealth to be able to sit around being um, happy layabouts. They had to work for it. Um, all the went to Eton. Um, I can't remember where Sharp was educated, but, but he actually must have met the king at the time because he taught the king's children um, some of that music. But all on the way to Eton one day, when he was a, when he was a boy, in a railway carriage, very hot day in summer, um, very thirsty, and uh, a bottle of lemonade was being passed around, but it came from a working class person who was being totally benevolent 
Uh, quite extraordinary, though, how someone who would earn a few shillings a week was offering lemonade to someone who came from a very well-off family, would have worn top hats and frock coats, whatever he can. And Orwell, despite his enormous thirst, couldn't. And he described his experience, and it was summarised by this one sentence uh, that, that had been indoctrinated into him, and he obviously at that time believed it and felt it very strongly, and that was the working classes smell. Well, they probably did uh, a lot more than, 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 than today, because the act of washing was very difficult. Uh, if you lived in the countryside at the time of the Dixon Harvesters, if you wanted water, you had to go and fish it and carry it. There'd be the, no pipe of water in the villages. Heating up would require lots of energy, you have to go and get by lots of fuel, which would be expensive and very difficult to, difficult to arrange. Uh, so the obvious amount of working class smell, which was sort of looking down on them, actually there, there was probably a big degree, of, big degree of reality about it. But when you think about what Sharp did, when he actually leapt across the social divide, because when he went around collecting dancers, he was talking to people right at the bottom end of society. Um, they were rather like the, the people pictured in the, in the, the hate making plenty. Well, I think it was a huge, a huge leap for him, really, but you know, perhaps it needs to be credited that someone from his social level would actually mingle with uh, working class people, gypsies, and all sorts. And, um, and I think it's one thing about Morris um, that actually obviously excited him uh, when he saw it first at Headington. And, Henry Corey, and then later on particularly Ancient. And the bit about Ancient, it, sort of, it, it puts me on very much of thinking about all these poor people working hard in the field, grinding away with all these, uh, against all the rigours of working outdoors for 365 days a year or so, um, and then coming on and doing a performance. And the, the bit about him going to Ancient is worth my reading. Um, it was in 1908 when he saw them, and it was a uh, scratch team from previous incarnations of the ancient Morris, uh, which, as he says, was seen under conditions that were far from ideal. The dancers met me, I remember, one dull, wet afternoon in midwinter in an ill-lit upper room at the wayside, wayside Inn. They came straight from the fields in their working clothes, sodden with rain, and danced in boots heavily weighted with mud to the, to the music of the afternoon, very indifferently played. The depression, which was not unnaturally which was not unnaturally laid heavily upon us, um, disappeared immediately as the dance began, and they gave me as fine an exhibition of Morris dancing as it had ever been my good fortune to see. And I don't think, you know, think well, the people at Dixon were like that, so they would have had this hard, heavy life, and then had this capacity to move away um, and from just work in the fields, and then the music, the dance, the spirit of it gets to you, and up, you know, and it uplifts everyone. <coughs> even someone from that high social status. You have also got other people with the, the, a much higher social status in, the, in this painting. Um, there were three things, sorry, I'd say that the, this appalling picture is because the lighting in the art gallery is really bad. Although you can take photographs there, um, most of that is, the, the, the background actually is a reflection of myself and Julia and the camera um, off the glass, which makes it very difficult to see what's going on. But in the foreground, you've got the, the, these three characters um, who obviously are the nobs, the, the, the ability, quite likely the Lord Lady Maller, maybe someone else in the family, or a, a bailiff or something like that, um, walking around inspecting all the work, because you can make sure it's going, going along. Maybe they're benevolent, maybe they were benign, we don't know, I mean, they might be like, yeah, like um, Squadron, Lordy, and Treasure Island, <coughs> very nice, or like lots of the miserable, evil minded, muddy grubbing, trushing people who used to be uh, landowners in the village in the past, who uh, probably really held a hell of people down, down, down in quite a bad way. Um, we don't know. We don't know what they were like individuals. It's, it's just not known. But they are carrying whips, which is an interesting thought as to whether it was there to um, oppress the people, except you can look back and, and see people actually enjoy themselves uh, dressed as horses, uh, but still carrying whips that look pretty well identical to the ones they got there, which suggests that they perhaps weren't there necessarily to um, oppress people. And the next time you see the outside paper and crew dancing, um, the up and the up and down there just you know, <coughs> after we got whips because it's usually past part of the sea. But another, there are also there is amongst the other bits and pieces of this painting. Um, this up in the top left-hand corner is this scene which I find um, perhaps for the most in, in some ways more than the forest. But there's this little scene of what's going on. You've got people in the corner sitting sitting down, lying around as I as I'd see it. And a couple dancing. Uh, again, this is uh, pipe and table, big drum. Um, 
And the first one, the first one I thought, well, it's a courtship dance. It's, it's this chap, faceless, as they all are. I mean, they're just, you know, no details, no eyes, no nose, they're faceless. Um, dancing away to a woman, and I sort of feel as though it's courtship. That they're out there in the field. Now, like, it may be that they're engaged in a couple of dance, we don't really know, but obviously it feels as though they're enjoying themselves, having a great deal of time, uh, a, a great time, uh, in the rest in between the work. Of course, another part, another part about people living at that time is that they had the same urges as us, they had the same hormones, the same bodies. But what they didn't have was the same freedoms that we have at this part of the, uh, the history. Because until the latter part of the 20th century, they did, uh, obviously people like those, until that time, there wasn't effective, reliable contraception. Which meant that people living in these communities had all sorts of rigid social um, attitudes enforced upon them, uh, particularly like basically being for women to be virgins until they got married. Um, and it meant that it must be rather difficult because if the hormones would never got too much, then the, the, there would be great danger of conception and illegitimate children and, and all the unpleasant consequences that, that happen. So, uh, and of course, one thing about haymaking, actually, this is a quick, quick aside, is that I suspect that rural frolics became a lot worse in the 20th century once. <coughs> Hay, ba hay baling came around because hay bale is a damn hard, rigid, unpleasant thing compared with, with soft hay that's just been carted around and How do you know? So, from from aspects of history, we know that it was it was very difficult. I mean, the history is full of tales of of um, <coughs> fallen woman, I suppose technically, who mis misled, especially. Uh, perhaps by people of, of, of the higher social classes. Uh, this chap, Thomas Turner, didn't live anywhere near Dixon. He lived in East Hoadley in, uh, in Sussex. But he was, I think, it was a church warden or some old parish, a parish official of some sort. And he describes um, how the, the, the pressure uh, on pregnant, unfortunate pregnant women was so enormous um, not to be in the parish. Because if, if they weren't married, had an, an illegitimate child, then the parish had to support it. And he described how, on a, one night, that there was a girl there about to give birth, illegitimate, and she was driven out of the parish, that yeah, she was dragged her out um, to make sure that the people in East Holy didn't have to pay the taxes to support her and her child um, through, through later life. Um, rather sad, really. Uh, I mean, yeah, and literally just full of these stories. Um, Thomas Hardy, every other page, it's a full of woman of some sort. Um, so again, rather, you know, there was very, very different sort of lives that these people led. You know, hard work, very restricted approaches, and I don't think that if we look back, that all the stuff about um, you know, staying pure and whatever was very much to do with intending that if you do have a child, then there's a father protecting. Whether the father's any good or not is neither here nor there. But it was just, you know, the hope that that was, that was going to be the, the, the hand of you. And until the social security came along, there was no alternative. So anyway, um, other little pieces. You've got Jack playing. Uh, more music in the field, people here um, think that big stoops. But also that there's full-time enjoyment, and you've got these, these children playing, having some fun. Um, so even though it's still hard work, you, know, you, you, you trust that there's some opportunity for people to enjoy themselves. And again, you've got these horses with a, uh, with a cockade on top. And the thing that amazes me is actually it's the shape of this hay wagon, because loose, loose stacked hay is um, it's difficult to get, to get the straight lines. It's not like bales which are nice oblong things, you can make a big stack of those. Um, and there's a hell of a job trying to get hay onto wagon, because you've, you've got these long forks, you know, it's been much longer than your arms, shoving up, huge huge amount of work involved, lots of muscle activity, you know, the people there must have had huge, huge muscles compared with, with most of us today. Um, and interesting in some ways that although mechanisations came along, uh, has come along and made it all easier, there was a time when bales would arrive and you had to use a fork to get a bale on top of the, the wagon like that. And my god, that's a, that's an hard job. A bale of 70 to 110 pounds or so. Very, very heavy. Imagine that long fork. Just lifting one up was bad enough. <coughs> used to trip away, but then imagine having a long fork and then got to get it <laughs> round in a big arc up on top of this wagon. Oh, awful. Um, that's all gone now as silence. Um, so more about work, and uh, I can tell you from my experience of farm work, it, uh, it used, to, used to be quite awful, and lift heavy bags of stuff around. Um, other bits of pieces, you've got 
Somebody else will dance for joy. Um, now, whether this actually is, is the gay equivalent of the courtship scene that I showed earlier, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. There's two blokes, and anyway, the one time we had fun there, he enjoyed himself. Um, so they're not quite sure what that one's doing. Um, difficult, difficult to know. Oh, yeah, and, and more children running around following a cart, possibly hoping to get a ride, because, because the people there, if they wanted to go anywhere, they had to walk. That was it, there's no, no alternative, unless you could get a ride on a horse or, or, or on the back of a cart. <coughs> Um, so their physical horizons and what they would have seen in their life would be so much different because they just couldn't have nipped off on, on the train or the plane or the car. But they would have known their area in much more intensely, much more detailed way than we do today. Um, well, you've got some nice interesting cows. You don't get cows like that these days. It would be regarded as being an horribly misshapen sort of beast, I suspect. Um, I've no idea what this implement is. Strange little like this. Huge perception crook. Um, could be side, um, another enormous cockade. I mean, I don't know what the horse thought about it. It looks quite fun to me. I know it's just a bit of style to have. Um, probably thought it was a felt like a total pillar. Anyway, didn't, didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, didn't they decorate the horses with the last load? Uh, particularly, yeah, that was particularly done. Yes, but, so that was the last load. That could but that couldn't be the last load because there's still the hay in the field. Yeah. Ah, but it could have been artistic license. Artistic license. Because that painting could be left. Of the whole harvest. Yeah, I mean, it could well be. Because you've got people cutting and stuff being carted away. Yeah, but they, they were taking days because oh, yeah, the whole sure, process were taking so long. Then I think you could have it all going on simultaneously. Um, but amongst the favourite bits, but um, <laughs> not this one. This one. You got this this uh, procession of people <coughs> carrying the rakes along. These big big wooden wooden rakes that they're, they're used for, for turning the hay, uh, led by a musician. And then you've got these two caps in the middle, <laughs> and suddenly slipped in. <laughs> and you can just imagine it, really, can't you? Because they saw, they there they are, the they're walking along. Artist! Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, George, how long? <laughs> well, the last one was about four days. <laughs> uh, you can just pick that picture. And, you know, despite, uh, somehow I feel that it's um, you know, just part of the moral spirit. You know, that it's there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there must be another part of it. Again, there's, there's almost, almost a hint of a face on these ones. So while they're out there doing, doing you know, showing off, you can somehow feel that these two women here and these two are saying, oh God, <laughs> when they ever stop, when they ever grow up, these people, you know, they get a couple of ballrooms on and that's it, they're, they're away. Um, well, yes, actually, well, it does, it does make me get in the mind about, about what you're what you doing afterwards, but uh, yeah. Forks and Baldricks, um, perhaps they went together there. Well, of course, um, <coughs> yes, really what this has all been about, I don't know, trying, to, trying to, to think about the lives of these people. Very hard, hard physical work, uh, deprivation in the way of probably food, water, temperature, and all sorts of other things, ground down by the, um, by the upper class if they had an, an unfortunate sort of government. Because you can think of all the stories, of, stories and folk songs about the people who were gone um, poaching, or whatever, in order to supplement their diet, and then found that the people, the people's uh, peasants and rabbits that are poaching were not only with their landlord, but also as the magistrate, who then had their life in their hands. And unfortunately, all too many people ended up being hanged or transported or something as a consequence. Um, but still, despite that, there's something that, that comes through about Morris and the straight power. And uh, these characters, to me, seem to typify it. And of course, it can still happen today. <laughs> you get some Morris dancers. One side of the camera, and that's it. And, that's it. and then they just come, they, they can't hold themselves back, and they get closer and closer, and eventually end up in this wild, <laughs> uproarious state, which somehow you can imagine that happening in Dixon, really. I think if they had a camera there instead of a painting, then, then that would admit it. So, so that's it then, really. That's my view of Dixon. <laughs> James has come all this way. James, James. Oh, James. Yeah. James. Um, <laughs> I have got yeah. uh, There's pro probably bound to be enough. What's the time line? 20 past nine. 20 past nine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, we can go for a popular show of hands then as to whether we, whether we like to make up some dances or, do, or just go back up to the youth hostel and. Um,
not to make some use of them. Oh, well, we'll finish everyone. Yeah, good. Someone, someone will see it three times. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We could have done it. We'll just go have a quick them. show of hands then. You right. could do oh, that. They're making Excellent. up back at the hostel. <laughs> <laughs> you could do the making up dancers back at the hostel. Well, we could do it. Right. Oh, yes. Room. Beth has provided the marvellous diplomatic solution. Which is that we, we, we make up some, make up some dance with implements back in the hostel <laughs> instead of here. But um, it would be, I don't know, it would be a pity, pity not to try and make use of people's inventiveness. Uh, Trevor suggested we watch some more videos, one, ones of the, the ancient history of, on, on the Pathé News um, stuff, which some of you have seen. Black and white. Yeah. Black and white, yeah. Why do you bring a colour telly? Oh. <laughs> Can't get them. But um, I don't want to force anybody to dance, but it would be. Well, perhaps some could go over there and dance and lose the lazy so on. Or we could just go out to the hostel and um, drink and drink yeah. dance there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Who wants to dance? Who wants to make up dancers? Put your hand up now if you want to, want to, want to spend an hour or so with enterprise and vigour making up some dancers here. in the barn here, we have a couple of quick long way set. Yes. 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 Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so right here in the old barn. Well, if you see that, you know, we, we got this venue, it'd be, it'd be quite nice to make some use of it. So we could do, we could have a modest number That's of dances of an appropriate style. And then uh, back to the youth hostel for <coughs> drinking and whatever else. Oh, you mean the style we have to make up with implements? Yeah, I think we ought to be, we ought to be dancing in the style of people of that era. Which era? Well, it's got a good Early 18th century. Yeah, I see, right. Right then. Sets, women and girls, and one extra person who has a broom or whatever. Right. A music, they can, the, the people you know, can be cast out down the bottom and back up, and the person dances with the broom. When the B music changes, then the, the, the blokes go, or the women go to the left, the blokes go to the left, and they come back again. Meantime, the extra person passes the implement to another bloke, nips back in the line, and then everybody has to swing wherever they end up with, but somebody will be off with the implement. You see, yes. you can change the implement each time. Ah, right, okay. Any idea what tune we should use for it? No idea. No idea. No idea, okay. but it would work. It sounds good. Right.
Das war das Zeug. Oh, 
this work. Yeah. 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 There's, there's somebody who works. I don't see very often. When we do see each other, we see the
Prophesy.